moved to the session on libertarians and conservatives and common core and we're actually not in common core i think most of us are against common core so um today we have um four panelists um and i'm gonna just have them briefly introduce themselves um just so you know sort of where they're coming from so we'll start down in the end sorry with me uh, my name is Kate Baker. I'm the executive director of the Network for Educational Opportunity. We're the first and largest scholarship organization in New Hampshire associated with our um, school choice program, which is an education tax credit scholarship program. My name is Michelle Lavelle. I'm the director of school choice for New Hampshire. Uh, I represent a grassroots effort to support all kinds of school choice here in our state, whether it be homeschooling, private schools, charter schools, different opt-out movements, including the refusal of Common Core testing. Uh, it's an all-volunteer organization. And my name is Anne-Marie Banfield. I'm with Cornerstone Policy Research in New Hampshire. We are a family policy organization supporting families. Um, I am a volunteer. I <clears throat> address education issues uh, at the State House, testify on bills, and my focus is on parental rights. Uh, academic excellence and literacy. I'm Kirsten Lombard and I'm an organizer from the state of Wisconsin based in the Madison area. I have worked uh, for the past six years primarily on state level issues and for the last three almost exclusively on the Common Core state standards uh, and related uh, false education reforms. Um, recently, about uh, two and a half years ago, I started my own publishing company, Resounding Books Pack, and our first book out of the gate was Common Ground on Common Core, which is the only tool of its kind. It brings together uh, 18, uh, 19 actually top uh, education activists and experts from across the ideological spectrum. Um, so it's nonpartisan and across ideological. All of these experts and activists, though, united against the Common Core State Standards and false education reform. And um, just to complete that out, I'm Jeff Horn. I'm an activist from Wisconsin as well, fighting against um, mostly Common Core, um, some other, uh, working for some other conservative issues in the past as well, in, out of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, also an author in the book, which I'll here, <laughs> Common Core and Common Core. Um, I really do, if you haven't taken a look at this, try to get a look at it sometime this weekend or, or we'll be around. Um, it really is a useful tool to talk to people, whether your neighbors, whether they're left, right, socialist, libertarian, could care less, all of that. Um, there's arguments in here about why they should care about this issue. So um, I invite you to, to take a look at this. Um, I wanted to, just start off, just I wanted to just look at the audience. How many, I, I want to kind of tailor this if this based on you a little bit. How many of you know what Common Core even is? Okay, you've heard of it at least. You might have seen the homework. You might have, things like you might have been through the homework <laughs> and so on. Um, okay, so um, I think we're going to take a little bit of a, a deeper dive into just sort of how some of this affects liberty and, conser and conservatism as well. Um, rather than just try to explain a lot, because it's a big topic and we have about 40 minutes left. So um, I just uh, wanted to just start talking to some people on the panel about just their, just to throw a couple of your major con your major concerns about Common Core out there. So I'm wondering, Michelle, could you maybe say oh, what your biggest concerns sure. about Common Core? It's kind of hard to narrow it down, right. uh, but there's some of the big ones are that it's uh, not local control. It really has been a top-down effort uh, through Race to the Top grant and funding uh, and all these other funding efforts. Like so, And then there's privacy with the data mining and the lack of uh, control where that data goes because the federal FERPA laws were changed. It's, I, I, I know that's kind of a lot to digest really fast, but uh, there's just, I mean, there's, there's like at least 10, re I've got 10 reasons that I keep track of why I dislike it. I, I just had one quick yes. question. I, I'm a sitting legislator in Rhode Island, freshman Republican. Okay. Um, I understand because there's a meeting, a couple meetings I'm going to, but there was a, a because the education secretary is stepping down, he was a lot behind the race to the top. We lost our uh, Deborah Gist who went on to Oklahoma, she was a big proponent, we got great money. But isn't there legislation right now in, uh, Washington, the Senate and the House both, I think, voted on it, and now they're in conference over it, I think. Yes. And, I mean, for me personally, I'd like to hear what effect that might have, and, and, and going forward, does that change the equation at all? Because I think one one side was against more 
a parental control. The other was that that was my understanding. So that would be very helpful to me personally. Uh, well, you can, you, there's, I mean, that's, that's, I, I can't even remember how many pages are in that bill, so, in, in each bill. So you would have to go through each bill to figure out the good and the bad, and there is good and bad in, in the bills. So yes, the House voted on, it's the, the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, if you're wondering what he's talking about. It's ESA, ESDA. Uh, th there are big problems in both, both bills, bills, and we have taken a position against it, and we have lobbied our legislators our U.S. congressmen and our U.S. senators against it. Unfortunately, uh, they, it, each side passed. So now that it is in a committee and they are working through it. Um, however, <clears throat> I don't expect that to come out of committee anytime soon. Uh, you'd have to really, there's, a, there's some great pieces written up and, and I would write this down. American Principles Project, Emmett McGrory, he was, he was actually here last weekend at, um, at a federalism forum that we had. He has written a critique that I think would act, would benefit you. His name is Emmett McGrory from American Principles Project. I can give you the information. Okay. He, he's the person that really has gone through each page, detail by detail, to, to tell you exactly what's wrong with the bill. And probably with a great deal of assistance yes. from but other incredible Senate experts. And House version or? Uh, I believe so. I think both versions, both versions are, are they're very similar, if, if, if I uh, recall correctly. But, you know, you're going to hear from the legislators that, you know, it, it reduces Common Core. There's some good things to it. But at the same time, you have to give up a lot. To, you know, if it's a bipartisan to get it signed by a president, <laughs> trust me, you're going to have to give up a lot. So, you know, to, to take this time and go through every detail, well, I think no, it would not be at better. All, but I just wonder yeah. if it helps or hurts. You know, well, uh, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It, and he details exactly why. But American Principles Project, okay. Emmett McGordy, if you need more information, contact me directly. Okay. I can give you his contact information. Okay. And I don't mean to take him. time, but it just, no, I'm just curious what yes. effect it might ultimately have. I, I, yes. I would say this, too. The, the ESEA is something that we've had since Lyndon Johnson. And it is the basic mechanism by which the federal government has gotten control of the education systems in America. ESEA. Yeah, ESEA. Stands for what I mean. Um, educational. Education secondary. Elementary and yes, elementary and secondary education act. So basically, what the federal government did is it said to the states, it said to the states, here's some money, and then got them to take it, and then now that they've taken it and are dependent on it, now they're attaching strings to it, all the way back increasing, to all the way back to 64. Wow. Every every single expansion has. So no child left behind. Yeah, is that you know, for a race to the top? That's also ESEA. Yeah. All of those, they all, um, Goals 2000, I think, was part or had a CSEA component. So all that point. I apologize for taking time, time, but I just was just curious. Yeah, okay. And just keep in mind, if, if Congress did not want the additional agencies that help that, they wouldn't exist. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Apologies. So um, you mentioned data um, as one of your issues. Um, could, I, I'm wondering if you could um, talk about a little bit about what kind of data is being collected and, and why you think that might be. Sure. This is actually very relevant uh, to what's going on right now in New Hampshire. Uh, we've received some grant money to expand our student database. It's called the Student Longitudinal Data System. And there are State Department of Ed and some corporations that are tied to the DOE have received federal grant money to expand that database. And that database includes over 400 data points. And it's not just the student's address, phone number, custodial parent stuff. It includes, uh, and you can see a full list of these 400 data points on the USDOE's website. Uh, it includes the parent's voter information, if they're registered and under what party, uh, religious affiliation. Now, for what purpose? <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, is that really academic? and helpful to the teachers. Uh, and then when you realize that because the FERPA laws were reduced in 2008 and 11, that now our schools truly are able to sell this data, our student data, to third party companies. It's fully allowed, very clear, it's very easy to read it. It doesn't take a rocket science scientist or some fancy government official to, to make sense of this. It's right there, you can see it on the USC uh, USDOE's website, look up FERPA for yourself, and you can find it out. It's right there. They can sell it to third-party companies under the guise of any kind of educational service they provide. 
So when Google is setting up different things in the classroom, who's getting that student data? Yeah, but I think it's also a good idea to understand why they're collecting the data, uh, because there's there's different reasons, and one of the one of the main reasons is because we are shifting from a liberal arts uh, academic-based public education system to a workforce development model, and you you might be familiar with that if you are familiar with what how they uh, how they teach in uh, like places like Germany and Europe. So essentially, what's going to happen is, <clears throat> and we already see it. As kids are, there's a lot of surveys, they're, they're psychometric assessments, you can hear those terms, and they're trying to get a lot of information on kids because they want to put them on tracks. So from an early age, I mean, we already have states that are passing legislation that kids are now required to choose their career paths by middle school. Um, it, you may not see it everywhere, and we haven't seen that specific legislation in New Hampshire yet. You know, I look for it. We'll be looking for stuff like that. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that. So you might be wondering, why are they collecting all this data? You know, there's got to be some kind of, you know, c you know, something going on that's evil. Well, you know, let's. We're just going to be honest with you. This is what it's for. It, it, they've already spelled it out. There's a letter from Mark Tucker to Hillary Clinton, M-A-R-C, Mark Tucker, and he spells it out that he was part of the um, development team at Common Core. So he has spelled out exactly what this is for. This is not something 1992, yeah. the, 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 literally the night that Bill Clinton was elected, Mark Tucker uh, sent a letter to Hillary Clinton. You can Google it, Dear Hillary Letter. Um, I believe Eagle Forum has a copy of it posted. You can find it also in the congressional record because um, a congressman uh, with the last name of Schaefer uh, was concerned enough about it a few years later to make sure that it was, you know, someplace where it could never be removed. Um, but that basically, it's an 18-page letter, and it lays out the entire plan um, for, you know, what this is all going to look like. And if you watch Mark Tucker's organization, which is called the National Center on Education and the Economy, NCEE, -E, um, you will see a, a number of slick publications that have come out over the years that basically um, market this whole plan to business, to government officials, to a whole range of teachers, uh, ad administrators, start to market this whole plan to a range of different audiences. They are very, very good at target marketing. That's something that everybody in this room needs to understand, is that you know they, they know exactly how to go in on all of their audiences, and they've done it. And they've done it successfully. Chief school, uh, you know, officers in, in your states, um, pretty much anybody you can think of, and all of these different slick publications that you see coming out of NCEE are uh, like they're like a. It's like watching uh, this whole plan unfold. That's what it is, because each of these publications is the next phase of the plan. It's, it's planting the seeds um, and getting people excited about the next phase of the plan. Um, it, just as an example, and I, I know you'll probably back me up on this, um, it, there's one um, that was done a few years ago that has a, a beautiful graphic in it that shows um, it, it, for anybody who's been wondering why, uh, like mathematics, they keep saying mathematics and English are so much more rigorous. It's going to be more rigorous, right? All this Common Core stuff, and yet we see that education is literally being math education is being truncated at Algebra two under Common Core. Remember, if, I don't know about you, but like I had the opportunity to go all the way to calculus and potentially beyond when I was in high school. Not anymore. Good luck getting past Algebra 2. And yet, this is more rigorous. So if you look at this graphic in one of these reports by the NCEE, what you see is, a, is this lovely little um, plan about how suddenly at 10th grade, we're, gonna, we're not going to have anything past 10th grade anymore. We're going to have common schools that go to 10th grade. And at that point, you're going to have to test. And if you don't test well, then you're not going on. Or if you don't, if you you have to test in a certain way to go on to certain career tracks. tracks. So you know this is this is real. It is happening. And I can tell you from personal experience. I would just say one more thing. In Wisconsin, for the last two biennial budgets, we have a governor who has very proudly put money in our two biennial last two biennial budgets to ensure that children as young as the sixth grade are writing academic and career plans. So this is happening, and Anne Marie is absolutely right. Right, and, and so if you're concerned about liberty and freedom, this should shock everybody because this is limiting your freedom and your liberty with your children. Because the, no, they refer to your children as human capital. 
Okay, and so I, I was reading a book that uh, Sandra Stusky was just part of part of writing, and in that book it said that education used to be uh, focused on teaching about freedom and liberty, and now it's about figuring out something about you know how where our kids fit into the workforce, and, and yeah. you know who trusts the government to do something like that? I mean, you know they, they have enough trouble delivering our mail and things like that. So, so at some point, the, so you know you have central planners managing the economy. Now they need to centrally plan our children going through school. Um, if I could just comment on the the Google thing you mentioned, um, my eyes started spinning in the back of my head. I have a 12 year old son that is in a public school in Johnson, Rhode Island. Um, so he just started middle school, and they were very proud that each child gets a MacBook, which sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. um, well, a weekend, he Beware. also got a Google account, uh, a Gmail email address. Yeah. Um, I had to sign a paper understanding that I am not allowed to communicate with my son through that email account. I cannot access it. Only my son, other students that have access to that Google account, and the teachers and administration of that school are allowed to have access to that account. Google so when you talk about the data. parental rights thing, I can't, right. and, I, and I had to sign a waiver saying I understand and my son needs to do this in order to get his public education. Yeah, and I would, <laughs> let me just uh, yeah. add um, in, in talking about exactly that, I mean, you know, Michelle and, and Anne-Marie have already talked very clearly about, you know, how the FERPA laws have been stripped and, it, you know, that your, your kid's data is literally open to anybody. All they have to do is phrase the request in the right way. That's it. Yeah. Um, but I think when you start to look at um, all the reasons, and Anne Marie mentioned this, there are more than one reason why your child's data is valuable to people. And we, we've just started talking about a really huge one, which is this career tracking workforce development angle. Another is direct marketing to your children in the classroom. Well, that was the intention. Yes. Of, of introducing it into them. It's interesting. You know, I just want to share with you guys that I, my perspective is just remember that I run the lifeboat company, and so my job actually <laughs> is to help children who would otherwise be trapped in public schools get out. And so I don't tend to concern myself with the nitty gritty necessarily of Common Core. Had it remained just standards, yes. I think we wouldn't be having this conversation. Exactly. The intention of Common Core, I believe, was actually to implement standards. I agree that standards should exist because I enjoy when a family calls me and says, I just saw the test scores come out of my neighborhood public school and I can see that my public school is not doing well, right? Okay, because again, remember, I run the lifeboat company, right? My job is to help children get out of public school and into an education option that works for them, right? Or, or a private school. So I like that accountability piece. I like the standards. Had Common Core actually been implemented by the states like it was intended to be voluntarily as standards, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. I, I, Instead, it's turned into this like weird monster of a it was, right. That, well, that was the original. That's the goal. crazy I, piece. Yeah, to me. I think I think Henry and I might. Well, I just wanted to you. share with the sure. audience that you guys are right. Yeah. And that it sounds conspiracy theorist. Like you might sit here and say, wow, this sounds really whack jobby, right? right. But I, the, the shocking thing is that people took these standards that were supposed to help, and now it's turned into like this incredible evil blob. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. It really I, is, is crazy town. I, there's you two know? points of view on that, though. Yeah. So I think that some people would say that those standards were crude actually created for this purpose. Yeah, and if yes. you look at the genesis with and the, that's the, exactly the, what companies I would say. That, the companies that put this together, this wasn't put together by professors or, or teachers, this was put together by five, essentially five people from, from five companies, big education companies like Pearson. Um, sure, though we could agree that yeah. parents getting to see that their schools maybe aren't doing their job is probably a good thing. Uh, if, 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 that's that's if, if that was authentic. authentic right. Right. If that was authentic, right. If it was authentic, I don't think it ever was. That would be yeah. great. Right. Yeah. Right. I think what we've seen, and, and then we should have answer Sandy's question, <laughs> but um, I think what we've seen is, especially over the, I mean, really over the last century, but particularly over the last 30, 35 years, uh, since the 1965 uh, ESEA Act, um, it has literally been one false education reform being implemented after another. Every single reform 
it, it sets up a crisis, which then demands another solution, which then sets up another crisis, which then sets up another solution. And this is how they've moved their agenda forward. So there has not ever, ever, ever been anything benign about this. There's never been anything um, positive about it. I think it's been really, really bad and evil from well, the very beginning. I think conceptually, that's yes. because top-down doesn't yeah, work. Right. I agree. Right. We could, we'll all agree on that, that yes. top-down doesn't work. That no. Real authentic reform would come from parents right. and kids and their neighborhood teachers yes. who know that, right? When exactly. you, if you look at education as a whole, yeah. when you see organizations that are closest to yes. the parents and the kids and the teachers, like small schools, for example, or even some of the charter schools that are grassroots, not your big corporate charter schools, but yep. like the ones we have in New yep. Hampshire, right. these little grassroots parent, teacher, child organizations, yep. then you get this authentic and responsive education environment. Right. Right? Right. When you're doing this top down, you're totally disconnected. So Sandy, I know how Mine's more of a statement. Now, okay. I came into the education world uh, with my children, in 92, 3, 4, 94 was when they made that big move for the outcome-based, performance-based. So Kirsten, you're absolutely right, and you can take it before the 60s, actually, but we'll start, where, I'm just going to start where I started in. And the agenda was there, and you better doggone well have your tinfoil hat on, because if you take back, <laughs> they are out for control 100%, that's it. Yes. There's nothing else in this. The standards that they set now are terrible. And it's not about standards. It's about control. Anything else is, I'm sorry, is very naive. No, don't opinion. say sorry. I totally agree right. with you. I wish it was actually about standards. So, right? so I would love to see standards. public schools no. held accountable. We need to get the national did. government out of it. It is not their job. It is constitutionally not their job. It is not in there for them to do it all. The only way is for the states to quit taking the candy and get back to local control. Right, and I, I think the, uh, the other point that, that comes in in exactly what you're saying, Sandy, is that it's unfortunately not just the federal government. It is a cronyistic government holding hands with big business. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, frankly, if you start to look at public-private partnership, it's at the very root of almost every single problem that we have in this country. I cannot emphasize that strongly enough, but education is at the top of the list for me right now. Um, Jeff, do you want to take some other questions? Sure. So, yeah, let's take a question over here. How you doing? Um, for those in the audience, um, your comment about crony capitalism, you actually caught me and made a loop. <laughs> <laughs> companies like Pearson, which is, the, which is a London-based company, are, they literally make billions of this. My name's Larry World. I'm a school board president of Pennsylvania. I was also a university Pittsburgh faculty. Um, there's so many things that we as school board members publicly were sold about the concept that are truly out front lies, okay? Mm -hmm. And we don't even have to get to the issue whether the curriculum is good or not, okay? Mm -hmm. All the rest of it, the data security and everything else, they're just not true. I mean, I've tracked everyone down. Um, you know, you know that this is not just a democratic issue, okay? So who? Who is the president with no child left behind? Does anyone want to say? George W. Bush. Bush one. Who said you have to read this bill to read it? <laughs> Guess what? Pelosi was not was not even the first person. It was the Republican head of the House who said that about the no child left behind bill when it was pushed on them and passed. So this is a bipartisan effort to change this in relationship to some really big companies. Uh, to control uh, your issue of data and, and tracking, that's one word that people use, tracking careers, is certainly one of the motivations. For some of them, it's purely a profit motive, but it's billions of dollars guaranteed locked in money with the kids left out of the picture. Yes. Take a question in the back. I want to apologize if this was already uh, addressed because I got in here a little late, but and I was in New York this past weekend the Mets, and I uh, didn't pay as much attention as I should have, but New York is rebelling oh, against yes. this big time. Oh, yes. You know, the, the police state, oh, yes, the yes. liberal tax welfare mm -hmm. state, and plus with Uber, they're also very much on board with Uber, but I was very surprised to hear this. Um, they are fighting, especially the national testing, tooth and nail right now. What is New Hampshire doing about this? 
Well, they're ahead of us. They're ahead of us by about a year or two, so I suspect that we're going to actually catch up to them at some point. Uh, also keep in mind that, um, you know, their former commissioner, was just who was pretty much run out of that state, is now going to be the U.S. Secretary of Education in this country. Oh, no. Cheers! <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody cheered when, when Arne Duncan resigned um, a couple days ago, and, and then I said, "Oh, be very careful and look who we're going to get." They're, so they're ahead of us. So they, I want to be clear about um, the testing because. Because I might agree with testing. Remember? I might agree with testing because I want parents to be able to see. Yes. But, what the schools they, are actually doing so yes. they can make good decisions about where they think is the right, right. education for their children. But we don't have that. Right? But we, just to be clear, we don't have that. Because in order to get what Kate wants, we'd have to go back many years to when we actually use achievement tests. We no longer use achievement tests. That what we are using right now is a psychometric assessment. Right. These are the things that when you go to apply for a job, an employer might say, fill out this because we want to know where you fit into this organization. That's what these kids are taking. So now when these scores come in and they've plummeted, like in New York, we haven't gotten our scores yet, by the way, in New Hampshire. <laughs> they have, they're holding on to them. Um, but uh, so when the scores plummet, and they will, and, and, and they're going to be released next month, uh, ask yourself, oh, goodness, is my school doing really bad? Are the teachers doing so bad? Or is it because they're using psychometric assessments and my children are not answering the way they want them to answer? For instance, they're going to assess their values, attitudes, and beliefs now. So if there's a question about global warming, for instance, how are they answering that question? These, these assessments are very subjective um, yep. versus achievement tests, which is more right. objective. Right. Two plus two equals four. I had a, um, a, a guidance counselor tell me last week that the SAT, when it goes to Common Core, uh, they're going to give a, a, a question, a math question, and they're going to ask a specific thing like, okay, you're in a hotel and you're charged 8% uh, tax every night, and then you're charged a one-time $5 fee. You would think that the question would be to add all of this up and give an answer. The question is, pick the right formula. So you might know math but you might get it wrong. Do you see what I'm saying? So your assessments, when the scores come back, the assessments are, going, are not going to be what, uh, what her and I would like, uh, uh, an accountable, but that's what you get in the private schools. See, private schools use achievement tests still. So a parent can look at those achievement tests and tell whether their kids are proficient in math or English. With these assessments, these common core assessments, these psychometric assessments, the key is to, if you want accountability, if you want to know whether your child is proficient, you have them take an achievement test. Get them tested outside the school system. Demand that legislators use authentic achievement tests, not psychometric assessments, because in Chicago, they're shutting down schools. In New York, they're e evaluating teachers with this. You are going to, basically penalize and punish based not on achievement, not on academic knowledge now. Though that's what they would have you believe. But that's what they want you to think. Yes. Keep in mind, one thing I'd like to add to that is that these tests are adaptive. Now, so when the kids are taking them online, and that's what they are, right? So it, and it is more efficient, perhaps. But that means child A, child B, child C are really taking different tests. Yeah. So how is how is that validated then? Now, I understand that it's supposed to allow teachers to then tease out exactly where the kid is struggling. That's how they sell it to the schools and sell it to our legislators. I've heard it. But truly, what exact, how do you then compare child A's score to child B's score to child C's score? And so our test results here in New Hampshire have not been publicly released. Only now are t parents starting to get them from the districts. They won't be publicly released until mid-November after our elections. Yes. Tell me that's coincidence. <laughs> what's, happened, what's happened in New York is when these test scores are released, parents are shot because parents who are used to thinking that their child is an achiever or a B student, say, or you know, doing well, um, are all of a sudden finding out, no, my child's failing. And suddenly I'm in business. Well, that's well. right. <laughs> this, is, this is some of the motives behind this. Behind this is terrible. Is that terrible? One is 
control. Yeah. Yeah. The state is interested in this from a point of view of control. And what they do if they hold, and you know, I've heard governors say this, I've said, we, wanna, we all want to hold teachers accountable. Yeah. But you got to be careful about who the we is. Right. Because what the governor usually means is the state ought to hold these teachers accountable. Not the and parents. I think what we'd all agree is the parents ought to hold these teachers yes. accountable. Right. Yeah. The other motive behind these tests is selling the test. Yes. Okay, so we, the, company, the same companies that created the standards have the ability to change the standards. They're the same companies that make the tests, sell the test to the state, charge them for grading it, and keep this whole thing going. So, so could we all agree that putting in school choice programs in states so that parents can have mobility and get out of schools where this might be happening to them is important? Yes. Yes, as long as it's constructed properly. The problem is in a state like Wisconsin, I and mean, we don't have the luxuries that you, I mean, you guys have oh, really, a oh, I know, but I'm saying, oh, but it is for the people now because you created it. Fair enough. We don't have that. We have a situation in Wisconsin where the state funds uh, to about two thirds of public education. Um, when, you know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. I mean, that's how it goes. And now getting them to relinquish that back to having local districts pay most of the money, you know, they know they're going to have a huge fight on their hands because the districts don't want to pick it up now. Um, but that's, but there's more and more people starting to scream local control. But as long as you've got the state um, doing most of the funding and then, you know, federal funding coming in on top of that, you do not have local control, even though technically we're a local control state, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the accountability measures, all the stuff that is, be, that is happening in Wisconsin, it's all done to continually rope people back into the common core system, back into the managerialism, back into the centralized, standardized mess. And, and there's, there's no escape as long as the state remains the principal investor in education. Take a question right here. Uh, just, uh, I'm from Wisconsin originally. I'm yeah. in New Hampshire now, and folks in New Hampshire can take should pay close attention to what happened in Wisconsin because mm -hmm. property tax relief and income tax was sold as a element to relieve property tax. Bingo. Which Under is the Tony same Thompson. thing they're doing here. We do yes. not have an income tax in New Hampshire. So effectively, the income tax, bizarrely enough, is a backdoor into increased control That's over the school district. Wow. So just wow. uh, just thought I would. That's right. <laughs> this is, and I can tell you exactly how this went. Tommy G. Thompson, who for a lot you may know, who was a former um, Health and Human Services Secretary under uh, uh, President uh, Bush, George W. Um, he literally sold this to Wisconsin as the biggest property tax cut in Wisconsin history at the same time without telling people he picked up it used to be that we funded education at the state level at about a third. We went to two thirds under that arrangement. Oh wow. Yeah. Could you tell a little bit more how was that sold? I'm sorry? How was that sold again? Um, so essentially what he did is he um, <coughs> offered Wisconsin the largest property tax cut in Wisconsin history. Meanwhile, behind the scenes he'd made an arrangement to pick up uh, education funding at the state level at two thirds, rather than what the one third that it had been. And it did not decrease property taxes. No, it did I, not. The spending was taxes decreased. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um. Th this was this was a major issue in the last legislative session, and you know, and I specifically asked me on HEW as well as on veterans, but what parents came before our committee and they said, we want the ability to opt out of this testing. Right. So right. I went to some of the meetings and I actually was browbeating the official from the, the Department of Ed because I could they would not admit that the parents could opt out. Right. And right. finally I, I got them to say, yes, you can opt out, but it was yeah. like, you know, the proverbial pulling teeth. Yeah. But ultimately I was working with one of my Democratic colleagues for purposes of trying to create something different, you know, a, a bill to redress the their parents' ability. The problem was, and you just kind of highlighted a little bit for me, um, we, they were using Common Core, and they moved to Park. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and so I said to the official, I said, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, Park is, where well, one was, Common Core was like a $5 a test, whatever it was. was park was like, yeah, kneecap, sorry. Kneecap yeah, to Park. Yeah, to park. Okay. Uh, kneecap to Park. Okay. Park was $35 a test. Mm -hmm. And we were, and it was 11 states, and that was down to seven users. So I said to a, well, what are we doing this for? Why are we moving to a more expensive test that less states are using? And again, the I thought of achievement test, which is I guess what I grew up with, 
versus what you're saying, these uh, psychometric assessments. That's not even in discussion. So now that gives me another thought, but then we're waiting on, I guess, what the federal government does because they kept saying, well, if not enough people take the test, you lose federal funds. Yes, so, so oh, that's a threat. threat. That's they haven't a, actually done, done it yet. But isn't that what's in this legislation? No, it's actually a no child left behind originally. If, if, if a school district or a state, I guess it would pick up to the state level, I don't, I don't think this has happened at a state level. If, if, what, if more than 5% of people don't take the test, right. they can't use it to shut down schools. So there's, there's the threat in No Child Left Behind that if your school, and the threat is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. the, the George Bush level that he put there was that all schools will be 100% proficient with every student. We know that's just not possible, right? So he set up something that couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then the only way out really is to get enough people to opt out so that the test is statistically invalid. And that happens at a 5% level when 5% of the students well, opt that's out. that's what we're trying to do. That's something that will allow them So there's to two opt reasons out. student parents want to opt out. One is they're, they're, they're concerned that their students are taking too many tests. Which they right, probably right. Are. That's one of the arguments. The other one is to fight against the machine because there's this whole data machine, right? There's this machine that, that's that, the other it, that they raise. It eats data. It, it, without data, it can't live. So, so the, the idea the, is, okay. don't take the test. Don't give it data. It'll die. So we're not going to lose federal funding yet. Um, they do threat, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, there's a series up. of intervening steps that are laid out in these waivers of what would progress, it, that's like step seven or eight, and not a single district or a single state has experienced that yet. It's, it's their way of threatening and bullying all these states, all these districts, and the parents. In New Hampshire, we've had parents tell us about how superintendents have pressured young kids, I mean like middle school kids, Oh, you really don't want to miss out on the ice cream party, do you? <laughs> I mean, really. Or they give or the Man Manchester, which is a big city here, uh, gives away gift cards if you participate. Oh, God. So, have you read the waiver in your state? Have you read your waiver application? No, no, I haven't. Okay, no. that's where you need to go. You need to look at your waiver application because that's where it spells out what you're giving up to the state. States are basically puppets now. Your state is basically a puppet yes. for the federal government. The federal government says, here's, here's what you need to do to get this waiver from No Child Left Behind. So then your state has somebody in charge that goes and says, okay, we're going to give up this, 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 and we're going to put, put and you in the park test, those so kind of things. They are readily available. They are. Know, They're online. The waivers in, on the internet. For uh, easy peasy. New Hampshire, our state Department of Ed has 85% of its funding come directly from the U.S. DOE. So who do you wow. think they listen to? Right? Who, whoever pays them is, becomes their master. It's certainly not. I mean, it, for, our Dr. Virginia Berry, who's the commissioner of ed, said that in an interview just under a year ago. Whoa. She said it herself. Yeah, well, I thought it Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment about the field studies because the only common core subjects that have actually been approved, the standards are, you know, like English and a couple of math, maybe algebra one and biology, but. Um, in my school district, they have, um, and I don't know if it's done this way in other school districts, but the administration has come to the school board to approve two different field studies. And I know it's for, com they're developing common core standards for different subjects and different grades, but it, they're not telling the school board that, but I could tell by some of the buzzwords like assessment and things. But they came in with a second grade uh, field study that they had approved for second grade music to develop standards. You need standards in second grade music. And so they're working on art ones as well. They're using, so they're using our kids as guinea pigs for these field studies to develop common core standards. And I think the dis school districts would refuse to participate yes. in these field studies. Yes. Maybe they, we, could, we would get rid of you know, the standards, but our, our kids are being used as guinea pigs yes. for something yes. that doesn't exist yet. And they're Correct. wasting valuable classroom time where the teachers could be doing substantial things, exactly. just experimenting on our kids. Yes, so I, exactly. I want to go back to... Do this again! <laughs> <laughs> I want to 
want to kind of go back to what we said about this, this model, this workforce model, it's terrible. and what that really means for a couple of the players here. We have five Think it, yes, we're in a workforce model, so what what do the students become? They used to become, they used to be the customer, or the person that they're was receiving. They're subjects. Yes. The, they're the raw materials. They're, they're the, the production the, output. Yes. Okay, and what do the teachers become? They don't become, um, you know, uh, skilled, skilled workers, they're basically facilitators, facilitators yeah. and assembly line workers yeah. in the system. It's They're really moving something through that way. And, so. and let's let's talk about what that implies about what's really, who the real customer for education is now. You know, we always, we assume that the customer for education is the parent and the child. That's who it should be if we're talking about true education. Now but now we're down to skills training, as Anne Marie has so clearly elucidated for all of us. And uh, frankly, it is no longer the parent and the child that are the customer for education. It is the public-private partnership. It is the big government, and it is big business. That's that's who the customer is, and that's what's driving the train. Right. Good question in the back. Okay. Three of you on the panel, I know you know me. I teach here in New Hampshire. I have a point blank question because I ran into this problem. One of, I teach high school. One of my students wanted to refuse to take the state exam. And I told her, I thought, that as long as her parents say it's okay, she doesn't have to take it. My principal told me that that's not true. There have always been refusals. This is not a new concept this year just because of the Smarter Balance Assessment. You, you can look at it going back lots of years on the department's own website. There have been over 500 refusal in each testing category for years. I'll send you the data, Pam. But um, it's not new. But it's not necessarily it's not state easy. approved. No, it's not easy. It's not yeah. easy. I it's mean, the kids easy. are pressured. They give you Parents are pressured. Her, she, made, they, she was made, she, they took her out of my class and they made her sit there. They, they threaten uh, kids with truancy charges if they miss too many days because of the testing. I mean, they really make it difficult. They really don't want it to be a parental choice or even a student choice in the case of the high school kids. If but I was right in telling her that, yes. Yes. absolutely, yes. And, and we tell them that. And frankly, oh, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court has off the, I mean, going back decades, there are court cases that support parents making the choice, even in their public schools, cho choices for their kids. So I'm sorry, I don't see how an ESEA waiver or even a state statute that says a school has to administer, school that's what it says here, it's yes. in our state statute, it says the state uh, statute says the schools have to administer. It doesn't say the child has to take the Dharma exactly. thing. Exactly. That's I'm sorry. That's, where they're, a, that's, that's the technicality, there. and that's what they were trying to use. That's why early on I, I, I sent a letter to the commissioner in New Hampshire, and I said, Show me the law that says that parents pretty much have to force their kids to take this test. There is no law. Right. And, and she did respond that, that the schools do have to administer. You know, the, the, the key is is that they don't want the schools going around hand picking out kids. Okay, we don't want you to take it. So the, the pressure's on the school to administer it. And, and but the, but if, I mean, high school students, do need, they don't need parental permission. They can just refuse. They can just refuse to take that assessment. And in fact, that's happening in New, in New York. And yeah. you can find things online. There's been like entire classes that have walked out of yes. these tests. New Mexico so, has yeah. mass and access. Now, obviously, mass you don't want a first grader to make that decision. But I think, you know, a junior in high school could probably make that decision. And and I do and let me just say too that this is this going back to the fact that this is not a partisan issue. This is a like nonpartisan or bipartisan issue. And frankly, you see this on you know people who identify on the left are screaming now. People who identify on the right are screaming. We need to be talking to each other because the more divided we are, the easier it is for them to conquer us. So if you have not talked to your neighbors who you don't think will agree with you, try please because unless we are united in this they are going to literally steamroll right and over to us. And to the few legislators in here, I think this is important. This is something that's just, I've started hearing the buzz here, and it's it's great, and I hope people pick this up and start putting it in state and local law. If you really want to put control over this situation back in parents' hands, you, you don't worry about opting out. You make a state law or a local school board law, if that's possible, to make it so that parents have to opt in. If the school has to convince parents to take this test, not leave it on the parents to opt out. Right. Remember, this is a psychometric assessment. In, in the psychological world, and Dr. Gary Thompson has testified on this, 
that if he were to give this assessment as a licensed medical child psychologist, he would need your per permission. Because this information in the wrong hands can do damage to an individual. That's why parents are pulling out. They don't want this information. So if it, in the wrong hands, it can do damage to somebody if you don't have the right characteristics, you don't have the right values. So they should be asking your permission to even test your kids, and they're not doing that. But, so I, uh, the one thing I have not heard, I mean, in all the testimony I heard last last session, no one talked about psychometric versus achievement tests. Mm -hmm. I mean, why isn't there a move back to achievement tests versus... Because this is a workforce development model, and they don't care not about your academic knowledge. Parents care about it. But when I you say care. they, who is they? The, 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 the pushing public, the reform, the public the private partnership that's driving The Common this. Core movement, the people behind who develop Common Core, this is a workforce model. The they were of on Commerce. the Common Core Development Committee. Mark Tucker was on the committee. He spelled it out for us. So they don't care about what your child does. They're, again, managing. They're figuring out where are the jobs, and now we got to fit these kids into this, these tracks. So, and w if you want to switch tracks, that's going to make it difficult, you know, down the road because you, you might be on this track. So do you see that? That's kind of the mentality. Now, as a state, there's things that you can do to fight back. Certainly as a legislator, you can do some, do things differently. Um, but I'm just trying to give you the, what their what their goal is, what their – so they, you know, I, I agree. I think, you you know, go back to the achievement test. That's what they use in the private schools and the, in the parochial but schools. Not, but as you say, you have an education, it's not what the yeah. – yeah. You have an education question, no, mission I, on your hands. I yes. point yes. you, I've got an essay in this book, and it, this is kind of dark and cynical. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. I don't know why. <laughs> Never <laughs> so, so, but here's the deal. I think that even though this is in the guise of, of, of teaching kids math and English, because oh. that's, that's how parents that's how parents will buy this. Yes. I think yes. one of the other goals behind this is essentially to show our children in two ways, both through their own experience taking these tests and by looking at what happens to their teachers based on their kids' test results, that they are to get used to the idea of being surveilled mm -hmm. and judged on the results that, that people find both in the workforce, they see their teachers happen all the time. This is accountability, that's, and you're starting to see this in more and more places. The, the examples I use in my book are Walmart, Amazon, um, all of the things that I don't think our politicians would want to call the jobs of the future, but I think are going to be the jobs of the future. Under this plan. They're it. all heavy surveillance corporations. And I think one of the goals is to get people, and our society is becoming a heavy surveillance society. So in some ways, by the constant testing, the formative testing, you know, track moving your school career based on this, it all really gets people just used to the idea from, from the cradle on up that you're going to be watched and what you do is going gonna, is gonna, to, you know, de determine your future. This is, and that's this not This is outcome-based education because you had brought that up. This is outcome-based yes. education. This is the work, school-to-work model that we had years ago. Um, we've just, you know, it's on a steroid. Yeah, in New Hampshire, yeah. it's called competency-based education. Yes. So competencies, you know, your parents think, oh, my child's going to be competent in, in algebra. Uh-uh. No, that's not what competencies are about. And I'll give you a perfect example. In Bedford, where I live, uh, they assigned a book called uh, Nickel and Dime, Why You Can't Make It in America on Minimum Wage. Now, let that sink in. This was in a personal finance class. It was written by a socialist, a, a, a political activist, in a personal finance class about how you cannot make it on minimum wage in America. And so when I pushed, because I live in, in Bedford, when I pushed, you know, wh wh why was this book even chosen in a personal finance class where you're supposed to be learning about simple interests, calculating those kind of things? Uh, it was based on a competency, okay? The competencies are not academic. They are skills. Are you creative enough? Do you collaborate? Those kind of workforce, this supposedly this is going to help you in the workforce. But what it's doing is it's shifting, shifting the focus from a, for a teacher away from academics to make sure in a math class, now I got to get the kids collaborating. Yep. Now I got to get them creative. So I hear complaints from math teachers trying to get through an algebra one course saying, now I got to get the kids collaborating because this is what the business world wants. The business world wants literate. Yes. I can tell you, I've done a lot of yes. business. Yes. They want somebody who can add, subtract, and write, and spell, and have vocabulary words. 
those kind of things. This is this is your essential planners telling you what the business world wants. Yeah. But if you actually talk to business people, yeah. you'll find that a lot of them just want literate. So that's why we focus a lot of times, those of us um, involved in, in New Hampshire, on literacy and academic excellence. And you know, true school school choice is what we want. But what under under some of this, what we're seeing in Wisconsin is you're not getting school choice because everybody's going to go to Common Core, even the private schools. That's so right. we work very hard, the three of us in this state and other people, to make sure that when we talk about school choice, it's authentic. Because we're, as we move to this workforce model, they're going to be pulling in the private schools and the charter schools. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen in New Hampshire. So I, I want to point out one of the goals of this, and if you can go to this, uh, I'm going to point out a document from the Department of Education that's famous for a different reason than what I'm going to It's, it's called, uh, it's on grit, tenacity, and perseverance. Okay, so it's the Department of Education. Now it's famous because a lot of people that will talk about Common Core will show about all the futuristic devices they have in there to monitor our children's heartbeats and eye movements and stuff while they take tests. Those aren't being used currently, they're, but they are in there, and it is sensational, and you might want to look at that. But the most scary part of this document to me is that what it says our children really need to get grit, tenacity, and perseverance to endure in the future is not these demanding jobs that are like, take a lot of brain power. They need to, it says right in there that they need to be prepared to deal with long periods of boredom. Oh God. Oh. Yep. That's what they need to persevere. So what is that, what kind of jobs does that like? Say to you, which kind of jobs? Those aren't the STEM jobs or the science and technology ones we were, we were promised, or at least not the ones parents think of when it's right. said. Um, what jobs are those? What What is the Department of, Edu of uh, Education preparing or wanting our children to be prepared for? George Jetson jobs. Okay. So um, yeah. uh, I, I guess we'll, uh, some of us will stay for questions, I think, after. I don't think the room's being I used, think but, Kate's got a book Kate? signing at yep. a, like, oh, no. oh, some, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, we, I, we have a book signing at 3 o'clock this afternoon in uh, one of the boardrooms. If you check the schedule, um, we will be there with copies of the book, and we would uh, love to sign and talk to you further, uh, Jeff and I. Um, and I know that I know I mean, anybody else on this panel is delighted to talk to you further today. Okay, well. Thank you. Thank yep. you, everybody. Thanks so much. I'm glad to see you.